You, yes, you, listener. Did you know that everybody at History Hack works for free? And as much fun as that is, it would be great if we could garner just a little bit of support for all of the time and effort that goes in to producing the show. Uh, I have a cat that needs food. Zach has Airfix models to buy. And Boney, well, Boney likes books. So if you can chuck us a couple of quid as a one-off by Kofi or subscribe to Patreon, we would much appreciate it. Thank you. Hello and welcome to History Hack. We've got a little bit of a, an alternative lineup for you today. You've got me, my name is Charlotte, you can call me Charlie, and I'm joined by the wonderful Kate calling in from abroad. How are you doing, Kate? I'm very well, thank you. I've been fighting with the Gibraltarian traffic this morning, um, but I'm here, so I'm very happy to be here. Excellent. Thrilled to have you with me. I think we're going to have a really good time. Who have we got with us today, Kate? We've got Susanna Ivanich, um, who is a lecturer in early modern European history at the University of Kent. Her research focuses on religion and material culture in Central Europe. She's written about religion in the domestic sphere, amulets and religious objects. Her monograph, Cosmos and Materiality in Early Modern Prague, discusses the idea that artifacts can provide material evidence of the nature of early modern religious practices and beliefs. Hello, Susanna. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. This seems like it's going to be a really interesting subject. You must have a lot of fun digging into all of this. Absolutely, yes. Um, it can sound quite dry from the beginning, but actually when you know it's about inventories and people's possessions, which uh, I'm always quite nosy about, it's actually quite a colourful subject. Fantastic. So... Um, Prague went through an enor enormous transformation, didn't it, in the 17th century? How did people experience these changes kind of on a day to day, on a personal basis, like you say? Well, I think it's important firstly to flesh out what those transformations were and add some colour to that, um, because there was this massive transformation. Um, and it, it will help us kind of understand what people living in Prague must have experienced in the 17th century. So firstly, when you think of Prague, uh, you probably think kind of Eastern Europe, but actually it's useful to realize that it's actually west of Vienna, about 150 kilometers west. So it's, it's quite far from Ottoman threats. It's quite safe. It's quite in the, in the center of what's going on in Europe. And in, 1600, it was the seat of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, um, and he'd moved his court there in 1576 um, to get away from those kind of Ottoman threats, and he'd established this incredible glitzy international scene. Um, so he had like a menagerie, including lions, he had parrots, he had a cassowary sent to him from the King of Java. Um, and he collected all these objects and uh, pieces of art. So he's kind of known as a recluse, but actually has this incredible um, dynamic court full of artisans um, and uh, alchemists and so on, and scientists, kind of scientists of the time. And he, of course, has all these embassies coming in from Persia um, and the Ottoman Empire. So this was a really a place that was buzzing with trade and diplomatic um, exchange, entertainment, exotic tastes and smells, and so on. But it was also pretty religiously tolerant. Um, and you know, part of Rudolf being interested in the arts and so on was, was um, the other side of him not being too keen to get embroiled in religious controversies. And he allowed uh, this kind of multi-confessional environment for the burghers of Prague. So in about 1600, we've got a majority of Protestant inhabitants, and these are mainly Eutrequists. And Eutrequists are basically like Czech versions of high Anglicans. They evolved out of um, the Hussites, um, who were established in the 15th century uh, by Jan Hus, who um, was burned at the stake in 1415 for basically raising uh, 
criticisms of the Pope and Catholicism, much like Luther did 100 years later. And out of the Hussites, you get these kind of warring iconoclasts, but also this more conservative group. And basically, they become the most successful. And then you just got a, a smaller minority of Catholics, about 10%. And of course, we've got a really large Jewish population in Prague. And around 1600, we've got about 3,000 living in the Jewish quarter, which is essentially a ghetto, uh, shoved into kind of corner of uh, one of the bends of the river. And by the end of the century, we've got about 11,500. So it's a really cramped uh, existence for that Jewish community. But it's also quite, you know, as, as things go in, in Europe, it's pretty, pretty tolerant. And after Rudolf's death in 1612, his brother Matthias comes to the throne and continues this quite um, tolerant existence. But then in 1617, Ferdinand II accedes to the throne as king of Bohemia. And he has been brought up by Jesuits. And he institutes the really the first real strong Catholicizing drive. But in 1618, um, three Protestant nobles chuck out of the window of Prague Castle um, these Catholic officials who are loyal to the Habsburgs. And although they miraculously survive, uh, possibly due to squirts of uh, the Virgin Mary's breast milk, if you believe the propaganda of the day, um, possibly because of a manure heap. Um, <laughs> is that another theory? Um, I think more likely, basically, <laughs> that kicks off the Thirty Years' War. So, um, and that lasts 1618 to 48, and that's one of the most devastating wars that Europe has known, um, with Catholic Habsburg forces pitted against the Protestant armies. And in 1619 to 20, we get this Protestant king being invited uh, by the nobility to take up the throne at the crown in Prague, Frederick of the Palatinate, all the way from Heidelberg. Um, but in 1620 at the Battle of the White Mountain, and that's something that kind of historians in, in the West usually know about Prague, that's the moment when the Habsburg forces uh, come in and chase Frederick out of town and start to reimpose Catholicism. So from that moment, Bohemia and Prague experiences this official re-Catholicization uh, with Ferdinand II and then from 1627, um, uh, his son Ferdinand III imposing this, these really strict rulings confiscating land and, and uh, expelling Protestants and so on. And in 1648, at the end of the 30 Years War, again, there's this kind of emphasis on uh, Prague and Bohemia being Catholic lands. So the Protestant challengers had been defeated, although actually in 1648, Swedish Protestant troops are still in Prague, looting uh, remnants of Rudolf's collection uh, from, you know, half a century earlier. So, you know, this is incredible stuff that's happening. Um, and then 1650, you've got the erection of this Marian column, which is another mark of these sprout up in the 17th century across Central Europe in Catholic lands to kind of declare victory over the Protestant heretics. Um, and then by 18th, the 18th century, there are accounts, for example, from visitors to Prague who comment on the incredible Catholic spirituality of the inhabitants who uh, are, for example, bow down to every statue that they see. So that's a real gallop through the 17th yeah. century. <laughs> and you can see this transformation, but you know, how is it experienced? That's the, the question here. Surely everyone noticed those huge confessional uh, pendulum swings. But on another level, did the battles and power struggles that concerned those elites of Europe fundamentally change the way people engaged with religion and belief and beliefs about their environment in a, a sort of everyday way? And that's my interest 
exactly about how beliefs interact with the material world around people and the cosmos at large. Um, and cosmos here is, is uh, the definition of it, the kind of loose system of correspondences between material and divine within the entire physical and spiritual universe. And this is something um, that is really not easily accessible in the archives. Okay, so to get at that question, it's necessary to kind of get away from the texts and treaties that are the standard of uh, historical research, because that's where the church authorities, of course, lay down the official record and what they want people to believe, and not necessarily what they did believe. So, so my kind of, I think the strategy here is then to look at what people did in the everyday. And the best record for that, for those that didn't write down what they believe in autobiographies, which of course are very rare in this period and quite limited to literate uh, communities, is to look at objects and what people use in their kind of devotional practice in the home and away from the church. And for this, it's fantastic because we have museums and there are quite a lot of things that survive. Um, there's not, not masses and masses, but some which kind of give us this, these little windows into, into that experience. And the bigger tranche of evidence um, that you can kind of pair with that group of, of material is inventories, which I mentioned earlier. So these are lists of household possessions. And if you've ever rented, of course, you'll know the inventory that you get of movable items that uh, will be <laughs> checked upon your departure, the end of tenancy, whether they've been damaged or taken away. So it's, it's basically this insight into what people owned. And basically it's great because you get to see, you get to kind of nose around people's possessions and think about what they spent, often quite small amounts of money that was available to them on. And secondly, it gives us that glimpse into lives that are otherwise completely lost to the historical record. And what those pieces of evidence show is quite a different trajectory of religious transformation uh, on a personal level across that century. So in kind of three broad brush strokes, firstly, up until 1635, which is around the middle of the Thirty Years' War, we find very mixed possessions. And by that, I mean, you get things like Paternoster rosary beads and crucifixes, which are generally taken to be markers of Catholic devotion and identity being kept alongside Lutheran sermon books. So Catholic and Protestant together. Secondly, and despite this official kind of Catholicization that happens from 1620 when the Habsburgs win the Battle of the White Mountain, it's only really in 1670 that we see possessions that uh, regularly kind of cluster around confessional identity um, and that would be termed more obviously as Catholic in the inventories. So there's a, a 50 year lag basically. And thirdly, finally, throughout the, the period, there's a constant mixing of these kinds of typical religious objects with objects that seem pretty unorthodox. So amulets made from teeth or semi-precious stones, for example, suggesting that everyday belief is much more heterogeneous than this idea that um, you have a clear split between confessional identities, Protestant or Catholic. And this is, you know, even a hundred years and more after Luther posts his 95 theses on uh, the Wittenberg door. So Prague Burgess spiritual worlds were embedded in their natural environment and social relations as much as, if not more than those confessional identities in the 17th century. Gosh, I mean, that, I mean that, that's such a rip roaring journey through a big amount of time. And I think for anybody who, who looks at British history, we recognize that, that sort of push and pull between 
the established Catholic Church to then the, the Protestant Church and the Anglican, which is, you know, not not vastly removed and people who want to go further. And and then we're then we're talking about Frederick legging it in the middle of the night and nearly leaving Prince Rupert behind as a baby. So this is this is all fantastic stuff. We had a really interesting find last week, just um, just outside of York, a tiny little gold Bible, which if, if you haven't seen it, guys, look it up. It's beautiful. Can you describe some of the typical religious items that, that people would have had at this time and things that we're finding today? Yeah, I mean, the gold Bible is fantastic. It's just these are just little kind of glinting gems in our in our historical record. It's fantastic to see. Um, but I mean, at the heart of this question is, is this other fascinating question, which is what a religious object is. And most obviously, they are things like those tiny, uh, tiny Bibles that you might be able to kind of have in a pocket, uh, devotional texts, devotional images, and also jewellery, especially in the Catholic religion, uh, are kind of used as tools to focus the mind on prayer. So um, objects like crosses, prayer beads, paternosters or rosaries, crucifixes and pendants, which are kind of stamped with religious images. Um, and of these, you find these examples that are so compelling um, because they give you that, you know, if you hold it in your hand, it's as if you're there. It's as if you're having that, you're re-experiencing that moment uh, that that early modern man or woman did. Um, and so, for example, in some of the, um, some of the things that we've found in Prague, you have these um, little cross pendants that are studded with garnets. And there's one which has this kind of backing of gold on it, which creates this incredible luminosity um, in the garnet. It's almost as if you're being um, taken into kind of Christ's blood as you look at it, because it kind of glistens and coagulates. So you can just imagine that moment through these objects mm. and comparing those objects to the inventories as well. Uh, you can get a sense of how accessible those things are. And actually, you know, a, a cross with 12 garnets is not actually one of the most uh, lavish that you, you would come across at all. Um, and it's these kinds of lists of objects that, um, that you kind of initially think of as religious objects that, um, that kind of forms one group that you might look at. But actually when you approach the inventories um, with that list, you get this kind of jarring feeling. And that's, that's what um, I found. You know, I was trying to find the, the number of crucifixes, the number of crosses and so on. But there were some objects that really kind of made me question the whole premise of that what a religious object is. And almost immediately I ran into this kind of problem. And uh, one that got me early on was this inventory entry from 1600 for a set of prayer beads with a wolf's tooth and two lynx teeth which coincidentally was also kept in a, a household alongside Lutheran texts. So coming from a 21st century perspective, this combination of kind of Catholic sensibilities, Lutheran devotion and kind of folk belief was really problematic and, and didn't make sense. And actually it's not untypical to find that sort of uh, a collection of objects um, and prayer beads in particular would be strung together with these amulets, or they would be made from uh, matter like amber, jasper or coral, which were thought to have these kind of powerful uh, properties. And it made me ask what these, these amulets are doing there. You know, they're not, in my idea, they're not religious objects. But... From the perspective of early modern men and women, that was that's not the case. You know, they are part of this world. They're they're part of the religious arsenal that people have at 
at their fingertips. And so it suggested kind of widening our parameters and thinking a bit more broadly about uh, religious objects. And it's those, those own, that ownership of amulets that you really kind of, uh, is really interesting when you, when you start looking for it in the inventories because you find none of them are called amulets by the way that the mm -hmm. word amulet talisman doesn't occur at all in these inventories but they're they're kind of referred to as jasper or jasper in the shape of a heart for example so you kind of those are the sorts of things you start looking for and you can see that they were as important to people as as the kind of paternosters in terms of engaging with belief and power and the ability to make things happen in this world, you know, a prayer to God for, for kind of protection, but also wearing an amulet um, against lightning, for example, with just yeah. one of many, many strategies people had. And the extant kind of items, again, to kind of go back into the museums, were really, really um, enlightening. So in museums, you've got hundreds and hundreds of these amulets in storage. And they're not really displayed generally um, because they're not part of the story we like to tell ourselves about this period, which is one of advancement and of kind of unconfessional um, division and, and clarity and these wars and things. But actually, they're an essential part of people's daily lives. And so, that, for example, there's one uh, little Malachite heart, which is just a tiny, tiny, you know, offcut almost. It's a one centimeter tiny, not very, not even very bright bit of green stone encased in a silver, and, and again, not a high quality setting. And on the back, it's stamped with a heart. And through it, you can see the Malachite. So you kind of think, well, you know, if that's worn on the body, there's this kind of idea that you can, your skin can touch the Malachite and, and perhaps get even greater effect from this stone. So, so you have all this range of religious objects in the 17th century, but I'm kind of argued that we need to kind of push it a bit further. We need to include these types of things as well. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like there was a huge range from from the obvious kind of religious imagery on objects right through to kind of natural objects. How much would things differ between sort of because a lot of what you've described sounds hugely expensive. Um, would poor people have had objects as well? I mean, would they have had similar things or, or would it have been very different what the poorer people in society had compared with what the most wealthy people had? Yeah, I mean, you do see this great range um, and it reflects what you might think that for uh, the poorer inventories, you can see either no religious objects at all um, or, um, or, and then you can see on the other hand, uh, the kind of great private um, chapels of the most wealthy. Um, but archaeology helps us here as well, because you see these um, uh, finds of bone dyes for, for prayer beads, so prayer beads that would have been made of, out of bone. And you don't usually get those listed in inventories. Um, and wooden objects as well tend not to be so, uh, so common in the inventory. So there is probably a whole load of uh, objects that are a bit missing to our eye, our historical eye, um, but to kind of give a sense of the, the costing, a jasper heart in a silver mount um, in the 17th century cost about 20 kreutzer, and a pair of leather shoes might cost about 35. So if you had a bit of money, you might be able to say, well, oh, actually, you know, this is what I, I deem a priority. So it, it was quite accessible, but you're right, the kind of the really the poorest level is, is much harder to gain um, evidence about. Yeah, it's certainly more accessible than I, I would have expected, for sure, yeah. 
it's uh yeah you've got to get your priorities right you're going to have the amulet <laughs> or your shoes but then you know you you're almost selling this to me above shoes and i love shoes because you're talking about some of the 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 powers behind these objects and their abilities to protect you against certain negative effects can you tell us a, a little bit about these superstitions and where where they came from yeah well they've got a really really long history um they are certainly pre-christian and and harking back to ancient egypt um, but one of the key texts in the development of those beliefs is uh, Pliny the Elder's natural history from about 77 AD. And in that, he puts together all the kind of known knowledge about the powers and virtues of natural matter. And this text is uh, printed and circulated quite popularly in the early modern period. Um, so how we coexist with our surroundings has been a constant kind of theme of interest in humanity. And, um, you know, we have thousands of years of feeling that we're part of this broader cosmos in which there are kind of sympathies and correspondences that we can, that we can uh, try and kind of control one part of our lives by manipulating another. Um, and it's also at the beginning of this uh, period in the early 16th century that uh, Paracelsus formulates this further by kind of defining the microcosm of the human body and the macrocosm of the universe. So, so this idea um, that we often have of this period as being one of disenchantment is really erroneous. Um, you know, it was set forward by Weber that we've got this uh, increase in rational thinking that's kind of led by Protestants. Um, but actually, when you look at the 17th century uh, evidence of, of what people were doing and believing and, and even writing about, this enchantment is really a kind of a touchstone for daily life. Okay, so what effect did the progression um, of, of scientific research have on kind of the significance of these objects? Did it did people's did people's views change? Did they change the way they the way they valued these items? Well, I mean, science is a really problematic term for this period, and it's essentially an Anachronistic. Um, so we should really be talking about natural philosophy and natural philosophers. Um, but I think we we all agree that there's this kind of massive advancement um, in knowledge about nature, but it's something that's still completely intertwined with ideas about natural material having these specific virtues and powers. So Part of the story of that advancement is that uh, people were, were really starting to engage with nature and manipulate it um, in, in kind of more and more advanced ways that, um, that were kind of privileged almost to religion. So being able to uh, manipulate nature, to do experiments on it, to make objects out of it, including artisans, um, were quite close to God because that, you know, nature was uh, set in motion by God and nature was created by God. So your ability to kind of engage in it as a natural philosopher um, was, was part of a kind of religious realm. And this includes, um, I'm going to be mentioning it, um, artisans who, for example, make these uh, life casts out of lizards and so on to kind of stick on writing cabinets and ink wells and stuff like that. Because you think about it, actually doing a life cast out of a lizard is, is quite tricky. So, you know, you have to have um, understanding and knowledge about how to keep these animals alive um, and not to kind of lop off one of their claws before it comes to putting them in their kind of furnace so you know you really have to know about nature 
So ex experiments and writing about methods and recipes and so on is all connected with God's world in this, in this way. Um, so actually seeking to understand nature is this, this very elevated and godly job. Um, and while the product byproduct of all that advancement is the kind of roots of what we know of as science, um, in the 17th century, it doesn't really change those beliefs. It rather kind of seeks to interrogate them. Um, and you get things also like in, in inventories, again, you can find this, um, apothecaries who own like agate pendants or surgeons who own crystals alongside all of their kind of cranial sores and things like that. They also figured out, it seemed that, that this was the moment when they they decided that that if someone is looking into manipulating nature and understanding nature for, for benefit, if they do this and they're a man, they're a natural philosopher. If they do it and they're female, they're a witch and they're going to be burnt. But, <laughs> but all of that aside, I mean, I, I just find it absolutely fascinating. Through the inventories and what, what, you've, what you've learned and what you've studied, do you see any similarities in the relationship between a person and their environment across religions? Absolutely, yeah. I think so. I mean, there are two two issues at stake here. Um, I'd argue there's not a great deal of difference between confessions between Protestant and Catholic. Um, so, um, especially in terms of devotion in the home. Um, so that's you know that's one area is is just thinking to what extent people are. Uh, carrying out their religious um, duties in this domestic sphere. And the Protestants have kind of laid claim to the home as a site of devotion, you know, as they shut the monasteries in the, in the 16th century, then, you know, where does all that spirituality go? It goes to the home. But actually, the Catholic um, story is, is equally domestic. Um, and indeed, it's integral to Christianity. So in the Bible, um, Jesus invites people to pray in their home and uh, for the father who seeth in secret will repay thee, for example. Um, but we're still kind of missing the specific uh, research, I think, on um, exactly how, how those things differ in terms of uh, you're thinking about your relationship with nature. I think, again, um, you know, it's been suggested that disenchantment is a particularly Protestant rational thing and, and Catholics are particularly superstitious, but it really doesn't appear to be like that at all. You know, there, there's, at least we need to nuance that um, far, far more. Um, and I, I think there's a particular scope to look at other religions, especially Judaism. So we know for Judaism that it's a particularly um, domestic form of religion. Many of the um, regulations for living a, a good Jewish life penetrate into the domestic sphere in a way that they don't necessarily in Christianity. There's this idea that Christians um, at home, it's a bit kind of free. You can do what you, can do what you want. There's a lot of advice. Um, for example, you know, if you're a girl, you should make a pretty altar. Or if you're a boy, maybe dress up as a friar from time to time to see what it's like. Um, so those, those things happen, but it's, it's not in in such an extent um, as it is for the Jewish faith where, you know, you've got dietary regulation for everyday eating and separating milk and meat, removing leavened bread uh, for a Passover and making meat kosher and so on. So I think uh, in terms of domestic devotion in general, uh, but also in terms of understanding the nuances of 
uh, the relationship between the individual and, and their natural environment um, could have some really fascinating results. Essentially, in the early modern period, there are a few fundamentals. Um, first being that God created the earth and the universe. So he's essentially this clockmaker who sets everything in motion. Secondly, is the, so in the great chain of being, you've got God at the top, angels, humans, animals, plants, and animal and minerals. And all religions kind of essentially map onto that. And all natural philosophers, being religious men, as you said, primarily they are men, develop theories that are in line with that and have that in the background. So yes, there are similarities across different religions that, that hang on to that framework. So you mentioned, you've mentioned some sort of in terms of objects and, and crystals and also in terms of sort of the broader belief and, and day to day kind of habits of people, I suppose. Um, so how, how does this relate to the present day? Um, do we see any of these kind of objects or, or any of these activities coming through and still being still taking place today absolutely i mean it always surprises me that when you mention amulets you know somebody at the end of a seminar will be like oh by the way i have this amulet that i keep in my bag i don't really believe it but <laughs> and it's usually got that caveat on the end um which is really quite telling um but there is the massive engagement with that spiritual sphere. I mean, if it's not an amulet in terms of a, a piece of kind of natural semi-precious stone, it's a lucky charm or a, a piece of clothing or something like that. Um, and also, you know, with regards to parenting. So, I mean, uh, pregnancy and childcare are two of the biggest areas in which amulets were kind of devoted to to um, protecting those realms and again uh, amber teething necklaces are all the rage at the moment amongst um, mothers and fathers you know trying to kind of stop this terrible terror of uh, a teething child <laughs> um, but also in terms of um, you know the pandemic now um, there have been quite a few examples of of people trying to kind of suggest that uh, amulets might hold off COVID so for example there was this uh, retract since retracted uh, piece of research that kind of suggested that a jade amulet might have some sort of magnetic counter effect um, and another one was a jeweler who uh, produced this coronavirus shaped silver pendant, um, <laughs> uh, was trying to sell it on the back of it, uh, potentially having this kind of talismanic effect. Mm -hmm. um, so these beliefs are really kind of present still, and especially in the context of, of times of great uncertainty. And at the beginning of this year, there was uh, research published to say that, uh, three in ten Americans thought that religion had been um, increased by the, um, the pandemic and one in ten Brits and anecdotally um, you get these kind of religious community saying actually we've had far greater attendance of our services online and you know um, kind of establishment of a community so there are all these elements in which those beliefs really do kind of continue. But I really, I wonder how and whether these views on our relationship with our natural environment will change, especially in the light of uh, the climate emergency, that framework mm. that I, I talked about of the early modern period where, where humans are in this kind of place of dominance. With such certainty, they believed that. That has all been eroded, of course, and particularly in the last few decades, we see the destruction that humans have wreaked on the earth, but also 
what the earth does to humanity in response and how weak we are in the face of fire and flood and so on. And we have also this um, kind of view of big history and deep time that's forwarded by David Christian and supported by Bill Gates, where human existence is a mere blip really in, in the long history of the earth. And it helps us to see our, our place here as very fragile and fleeting. So in the everyday, how does this translate to shaping our beliefs um, you know, we, we already see Chinese medicine, for example, as controversial in the West using animal matter um, and kind of precious natural objects for healing, which has cent uh, centuries of, of tradition behind it, but it's really problematic when we're thinking about natural resources today. And do we think about amulets and uh, the jewelry that we wear in the same way? Um, none of those practices are really kind of sustainable in, in this current uh, way that we think about the world. So I think depending on our beliefs and prosperity and culture, that people will tweak how they interact with the natural environment. But having said that, we're still kind of desperately searching for things to believe in, like that great belief in science, ways in which we can control the onslaught of those dangers and anxieties that we face in the everyday as part of our existence. And that, I think, won't change. That's so interesting. Susanna, one last question before we wrap up today. Do you have an amulet or something that you carry around with you and that you you have in your corner well someone gave me a hag stone the stones you find on the beach with the little holes in them um, um, when I launched my book so that is now mine and I'm very proud of it and it sits on my computer fantastic Kate do you have anything no I think that was yeah really interesting and I, I love the fact that we're still using methods to, to prevent or ease suffering that we've been using for thousands of years and despite modern science and everything else we're still putting amber necklaces on babies to help them with their teething pains I think it's brilliant I mean, that's it. an interesting point Kate but what I really want to know is do you have an amulet no not <laughs> really I have lots of different things that are very personal to me in my house but I don't have any one thing that I carry with me or anything like that amazing yeah I'm unable to pass a single magpie. Um, so Lord help you if I'm I'm driving and, and I see a single one. Susan, so the question is, do you have an amulet? Do I have an amulet? Um, I've got a rosary. I have a rosary necklace that I got at the Vatican from one of those little um, shonky stools outside, which I quite like when I'm when I'm feeling feeling concerned. That tends to come out. But uh, other other than that. I'm uh, no, not at all suspicious at all. I don't have to make a new moon list every new moon. Susanna, <laughs> thank you so much for coming and joining us. Would you tell us where we can keep in touch with you, where we can follow your research and uh, yeah, after the show? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> also, where, where we can keep in touch with you after we finish listening. Yeah, you can uh, find me on my uh, website, uh, but also on Twitter at Susanna Ivanich. Fantastic. Thank you so much. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.